the day, it's, it's a new uh, station. So, therefore, you know, I mean, almost every other story you see here is a story.
Good evening. I'm Albert Kreinesale, the Dean of the John F. Kennedy School of Government, and it's my privilege to welcome you here uh, this evening. This is the first day of our academic year. It's the first day of classes here at the school, and we're delighted to have this event sponsored by the school and the Institute of Politics to begin our academic year. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome several people here before I get to the formal introduction. First, uh, from the Consulate of Brazil in New York, His, excellent Marco, His Excellency Marco Cesar Noslowski is with us uh, this evening, as well as his uh, counterparts here in Boston. I'd also like to welcome and, and thank the members of the Brazilian American Chamber of Commerce who traveled here from New York and were so helpful with uh, arranging this event for us this evening. And of course, I'm pleased to welcome uh, the rest of you here to this first event here at the Kennedy School, and I hope you'll participate in many more. A few words about uh, tonight's speaker. He first uh, burst into Brazil's national stage, indeed the international stage, through his governorship of a small, poverty-stricken state of Sierra from 1987 to 1991. Um, Governor Jerry Sati implemented successful health care reforms in the midst of severe economic problems. Well, this sounds familiar to those of us that are uh, Americans. And, um, and health care reform was far more than just a slogan to the governor. He declared child survival a state priority. And in 1987, he created a new program in English, long live the child. The emphasis was on prevention of disease and on family visits. Community health agents actually walked door to door providing services. And in four years, Sierra cut its infant mortality rate by almost a third. Uh, in recognition of this achievement, UNICEF has recently awarded to the people and the state of Sierra the 1993 UNICEF Maurice Pate Award, a prize that honors child protection efforts. And this is the first time in the 27-year history of that award that has gone to a country in South America. Uh, these reforms are all the more impressive when one realizes that in Brazil, the top tenth of the population controls nearly 50% of the wealth, while the bottom tenth owns less than 1%. And this large gap is widening. Now, as governor, uh, Mr. Jerry Sachi applied the tools of business to the bankrupt administration that he inherited. He replaced the patronage system with merit exams and began something virtually unheard of in government, dismissing employees who were not performing. Teachers were induced with higher salaries to improve their credentials. And those who chose not to do so were no longer part of the educational system. Unlike most of Brazil, in his state, Sierra, almost every child attends public school. The state's budget was put in order, and its bills were paid on time. Uh, surely tonight's speaker has much to teach us about reinventing government which is our current slogan. Uh, this coming year will be a big political year in Brazil. In addition to a presidential election next fall, Brazil's constitution is due for its uh, five-year review. And now, as head of Brazil's third largest party, the Social Democratic Party of Brazil, Governor Jerry Sato plays a major role in the nation's dialogue. Uh, I cannot go through this um, introduction without noting that our speaker has often been mentioned as a potential presidential candidate for Brazil, which reminds me that uh, a forum address made in this room to a similar audience in 1991 uh, was made by someone who was a governor of a small state, <laughs> one of the poorest states in our nation. Uh, that governor had balanced his state's budget, had improved his state's health care and educational systems, and had revived his state's sense of community. Uh, that governor is now the president of the United States. 
Now, it remains to be seen how much longer the careers of our president and tonight's speaker will continue along similar paths. Uh, please join me in welcoming the president of the Social Democratic Party of Brazil, Tasu Gerasachi. Mr. Gandel, Dean of the John Kennedy School of Government, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like first to apologize for, for my English, that's why I have to read, and um, to thank for the opportunity to speak here in this school. And I'll talk about uh, the Brazilian stabilization and uh, the Brazilian development. In order to understand the problems facing Brazil today, we need to go back in time a little. There's a growing consensus nowadays in our society that the economic crisis cannot be considered isolated from its political component. The stagnation of the 80s and the consolidation of democracy in our country eclipsed the emergence of a political crisis inherited from a long authoritarian period. In reality, economic and political issues have always been intimately linked. In the Brazilian development model, which prevailed since the 30s until the late 70s, the state played a significant role, both as a regulator of the economic activity and as a producing agent. In the 60s, in addition to this economic model, an authoritarian political regime facilitated even more the establishment of a large and interventionist state. With the exhaustion of this model and the dawning of democracy, the need arose to fully review the dynamics of this growth. This review, which favored competition by lessening trade barriers and state controls, was surely expected to reveal new winners and losers. I believe that political difficulties were and still are the main obstacle to the consolidation of a new economic social project. The political imbroglio is a heritage of the military regime who took over in 1964 and began to fall apart in the early 80s. The ancient regime made two main political mistakes. The first one was that it prevented the springing up of a new class of political leaders capable of keeping pace with a rapidly changing society. Most of today's party leaders were formed during this period of national development. In the 80s, the historical scenario changed and brought about a reality which, in many aspects, was completely different from the one that prevailed when these men shaped their political positions. The second big mistake made by the military regime was the decision to abolish traditional political parties, fully dismantling during their organization. If readapting the society to a new growth model is in itself a great challenge, the task becomes even more difficult in the absence of a solid party base to carry out this process. As a result, for many years, we have been unable to move forward in the transition from an interventionist and protective model to one characterized by greater competition and the lesser presence of the state. The difficulty to advance beyond this phase is clearly reflected in the interruption of a cycle marked by extraordinary GDP growth. Between 1940 and 1980, the average annual GDP growth in Brazil exceeded 7%. This excellent performance was achieved in spite of serious difficulties faced by the country along those four decades. During that period, the GDP was multiplied by a factor of 15, meaning that there was a five-fold increase in per capita GDP. In dollars of 1990, per capita income grew from $600 to $3,000 between 1949 and 1980. 
During this period, Brazil had one of the best performance in the world economic scenario. The 80s in Brazil are referred to as a lost decade. Due to the poor macroeconomic performance registered during this period, considering the poor performing, performance registered in recent years, this, this lost decade should be elongated to include the first years of the 90s. The stagnation which began in the turn of the 70s represented more than a gap in the growth pattern. It was actually the end of a model. Following a world trend, there has been a dramatic change in the way Brazilians view the, the role of the state. Until the 70s, economists at large believed that the society would benefit from a strong intervention of the state in the economy in many areas, even in productive sectors. A according to this line of thought, the presence of the state was justified by the need to offset market fails in the allocation of resources in developing countries, characterized by market regional, sectorial, and income imbalance. In the early years of the 90s, we have a completely different view of the role of the state. This recent awakening was partly forced by a sequence of events which had strong negative impacts on the economy. Difficulties began with the rise in international interest rates, the second oil shock, and the international financial crisis. This wave of difficulties provoked the foreign debt crisis and its counterpart, the domestic fiscal crisis. Ten years of stagnation and high rates of inflation are the heritage of these difficulties. The fiscal crisis, which has become more and more visible in recent years, made it clear that we have an oversized state which has become paralyzed by the failure of its financial mechanism. A forced industrialization process, led by investments directly made by the state or induced by it, was unable to propel economy and social development. The, mo the modern technological and organizational revolution, which occurred in the recent years, is fully incompatible with the national development mo model of the 50s. Taken to extremes, as in Brazil's case, the import substitution industrialization project ended up becoming a tool, a tool for refeeding industrial inefficiency. The strong centralizing entrepreneurial state ended up exceeding its saving and managing capacity to a large extent. As a result, it became a swollen state and capable of withdrawing from activities where its present was no longer recommended or necessary. Instead of, of playing the role of inducing the development which it actually played for many years, it became a barrier to the, de the development since the second half of the 80s. This exhausted and anachronistic project took much beyond its possibilities, left a large and an inefficient state. Consequently, it became unable even to respond to the demand of areas where its presence will be indispensable. The balance of payment crisis caused by the fast inward-looking industrialization process surfaced in the early 80s as the flow of foreign credit was suddenly interrupted. The inability to deal with the problem led to an, uh, an unprecedented domestic debt and others well-known results, public deficits, fiscal crisis, and bankruptcy of the state, topic, topics invariably considered in the analysis of the Brazilian problems. Uh, one of the consequences of this fiscal crisis was that ideological aspects were eclipsed by other considerations in debates on the privatiz privatization program. There's no way to discuss whether we should or not have a state-controlled productive sector based on ideologic considerations. We already had one in the past, and it is an important explanatory factor for our present stage of development. Presently, however, we were left with no choice as the Treasury has exhausted its capacity to fund state enterprise and the society cannot bear additional taxes to preserve undertakings 
whose return is uncertain. In order to provide a clear picture of the volume of resource needed to keep state-owned companies in operation, let us, let us recall that between 1982 and 1992, the net flow of funds from the treasury to the companies already including, included in the privatization program amounted to $22 billion, 5% of GDP. Apart from discuss, there is also the need to step up the competition and increase the efficiency in several sectors which were protected from foreign and domestic co competition in the past. Between 1981 and 93, 57 companies were privatized. In spite of the sale of 20 companies, the Figueredo administration, 79 to 85, generated only $119 million in income. And the Sane administration, 85 to 90, an additional sum of $500 million. The phase of privatiz privatization program, which was more vigorously resumed during the Color administration, practically came to an end in August of this year with the sale of 24 companies. During this period, the sale of all the iron and steel sector, a symbol of the national development model, was concluded. As a result, the government debt decreased by $5.2 billion. In the next phase of the program, about 30 companies are expected to be privatized. In the next two years, it's expected that an additional sum of $11 billion will be raised with the inclusion of companies operating in the electoral and railroad sectors. With the conditional review, the process will gather a new momentum as more sectors will be included in the privatization effort. This change added to the initiative of the federal administration to increase the participation of foreign capital in the purchase of state enterprise will allow the national privatization program to become, as in the case of neighboring countries, a component of the stabilization policy by significantly contributing towards the issuance of short-term government debt. The combination of macroeconomic crisis with the exhaustion of the industrial model fostered a review not only of the role of the state, but also of the country's development model itself. We are no longer a closed and protected economy, and we opted for establishing a competitive industry one capable of integrating into the world economy. The most outstanding evidence of this option is the new profile of custom duties on July 1, 1993, which concluded a process initiated back in 1990. The result was a reduction in the average tariff of 34.2 percent to 14.2% uh, in 1990. The response to this opening process has been positive. In the last two years, a remarkable growth in labor productivity in the industrial sector and trade flows in port plus export was registered. This year, Brazilian exports are expected to hit the mark of $40 billion, a fact which, together with a natural increase in import, will raise our trade flow from about $50 billion in 1992 to $63 billion in 1994. The lesser protection of the national industry and the greater exposure of the international competition is particularly positive if we take in into account the fact that this process took place in the context of a high rates of inflation and economic stagnation. Together with trade liberalization, we are also experiencing a financial liberalization process which, sig which significantly stepped up the entry of foreign capital into the country. Our balance of payments of 1992 registers a capital surplus of $15.7 15 billion against a deficit of $4.5 billion in 1991. This movement can be explained not only by the high domestic interest rates that prevailed last year, 
but also by the sure feeling that Brazil is in the right path. As a result, our international reserves have reached the comfortable level of $25 billion. To put it briefly, we can see that there has been a clear advance towards a more modern and open economy. We have overcome a critical situation caused by low international reserves and the interruption of our relations with the, with the international financial community and have reached the present comfortable liquidity position in addition to being one step away from closing a foreign debt agreement, which is expected to be concluded until November of this year. The privatization process, practically non-existent four years ago, is one of the cornerstone of the stabilization program today, with expected gains of 11 billion in the next two years. The National Congress has not failed to approve any deregulation and modernization bill proposed by the government, as evinced by the end of the law which protected the computer industry, the modernization of the ports, and the industrial property law. As a result of the recessions of 1981 to 83 and 1990 to 92, per capita GDP reached a level of only $2,800 in 1992 approximately 7% below its level in 1980. If the historical trend registered until 1980 had prevailed, per capita GDP would have reached the level of $6,000 in 1992. Of course, it's just an, a statistical exercise. We would hardly expect the pace of economic growth to be maintained in the middle of external and fiscal crisis. Nevertheless, it was an interruption which seriously affected the development of our economy. In addition to the loss of income, of income demonstrated by this tentative exercise, the most serious aspect to be considered are the social losses for our, our country with such a huge unmet repressive demand for better health, education, food, and housing conditions. Therefore, the task facing the economic policy today is that the stab stabilizing the economy while, while lessening the poverty levels, levels inherited from this recent, recent past. At the outset of a new growth cycle in the country, our duty is not only to avoid past distortion, but also to correct them. In spite of the remarkable growth of the Brazilian economy, considering that we registered the second highest annual growth rate in the last 30 years just behind Japan, the distribution of gays during this period was not socially fair. It was, on the contrary, a twisted growth model whose heritage was the social marginalization of part of our population. Our duty, therefore, is to attain a more homogeneous growth allowing the marginal, marginalized population to be reintegrated into the society. We have real condition for this to happen. We are provided with the necessar necessary natural and human resource and with a mature industry which has already adjusted itself to the demands of a new growth model. Therefore, what are the obstacles? First, a political obstacle. We saw how the authoritarian regime prevented the springing up of a renewed political class capable of keeping pace with a changing society and of meeting the demand for a more agile and efficient state. The leftist parties, although not representing the majority, have been resisting the idea of reducing the state. In the recent past, this kind of worry was justified by the mistakes made by the, by the authoritarian regime. Today, however, we know that the state has gone bankrupt and we are becoming aware of the importance of reforming or rather reconstructing it so that it may efficiently meet the basic needs of the population through the implementation of a true social policy. The two main leftist parties, which are labor parties, have been unable to preserve the ideals they use to stand for. Today, they represent much more the interest of a state-controlled corporatism, 
with its privileged stronghold than those Brazilians wage earners. The parties on the right, on the other hand, are frequently liberal only in their titles. In their clientelistical political practice, they continue to be bastions of a centralized state-controlled Brazil. We must overcome these obstacles in order to begin a movement aimed at integrating the three Brazils, the state-owned Brazil, which has gone bankrupt and is unable to perform its most elementary functions, as evinced by the recent massacres involving the military police itself. The private Brazil, whose performance has been relatively good, and the Brazil of the miserable. The Brazilian state must take social measures in relation to the miserable Brazil without become, becoming an entrepreneur, entrepreneurial state or protective state. This is why it's necessary to reform it and dismantle monopolistic strongholds. The second obstacle is of an economic nature, namely overcoming the macroeconomic instability derived from the fiscal crisis. The financial recovery of the public so sector is a matter of vital importance for Brazil today. It is a national salvation task and a political and economic challenge that can be briefly descri described as follows. First, Brazil only will manage to consolidate its democracy by positively tackling the deep wants and social imbalances affecting the daily of the population. Second, the social debt can only be redeemed through enhanced economic growth plus the resumption of a sustained high employment levels. Third, the economy will only start growing again in a lasting way under conditions of macroeconomic stability, a goal which necessarily includes a new fiscal regime. Fourth, the public accounts will only be settled if the country's political forces decide to move firmly in this direction, forsaking private, corporative, or privileged interests. Five, the economic policy should place priority on combating inflation, since it is the most unfair imposed on our society and the one that concentrates income the most. In Brazil, indexation is a very far-reaching phenomenon. We even have an indexed currency, government securities, which is indexed daily life and is readily convertible into money supply. But not everybody can access these remunerated accounts. The largest majority of the population doesn't even have a bank account. In this process, a monthly inflation of 30% means the loss of one third of the purchasing power of the salaries between the beginning and the end of a month. The economic program is in course. The immediate action program of Minister Fernando Henrique Cardoso is different from previous plans and in, in, in important ways. The plan is based on the assumption that the Brazilian inflation crisis is of an essential fiscal nature. Recovering public finance equilibrium involves much more than the basic principle of spending less and collecting more. It involves a broad reorganization of the public sector and of its relations with the private economy, including the following step. Cuts and greater efficiency in spending, recovery of the tax revenue, and of the default of states and counties on debts with the union, control and street inspection of state-owned banks, restoration of federal government-owned banks to sound financial conditions, privatization. In little more than three months, the results attained in these areas have been very positive. However, the process of reorganizing the public finances initiated by the Immediate Action Program will be consolidated through the constitutional review. The review will begin in October of this year, and this, the, as, as the Constitution of 1988 itself provides for. The constitutional review is extremely important in connection with the reconstruction of the state. We are using the term reconstruction instead of reform on purpose, as we have gone beyond the stage where just reforming the state was necessary or sufficient. There should also be change in the fiscal area. 
with the aim of harmonizing the strong decentralization of revenues and the fiscal competences which characterize our federative system with the provisions, provision of quality health, edu education, and social assistance. The social security system should also be put on a sound financial basis. In the political sphere, the reform will aim at reducing the fragmentation of the political parties so that a responsible and solid political base may be built, committed to the necessary economic and social reforms. Brazil has furthered its redemocratization process perhaps more than any other Latin America country. We are a multi-party nation. We have a free press reflecting the opinion of several sectors of the economy and free trade union association. The political reform is not intended to interfere with this multi-party framework in any way, but rather to reduce the number of parties with no representativeness and which, nevertheless, manage to create serious, serious obstacles to the change demanded by society. In sum, we can say that one of the most important challenges facing us is the implementation of a democratic stabilization plan in a political system marked by the springing up of many political parties, enhanced federalism on the eve of a general elections, which will be held in 1994. Putting it briefly, we can affirm that the Brazilian economy reveals very positive results. The federal debt in bonds and bills amounts to $35 billion, while the assets of the state enterprise add up to the double that sum. The country is settling solvent. Domestic debt amounts to less than 10% of GDP, and the foreign bank debt adds up only about $40 billion, against an estimated for $450 billion GDP. Any comparison with other reveals the solvency position of the Brazilian economy. We have unquestionably opted for a more open economy with less participation of the state. Despite the new and puzzling international trade scenario, Brazil will not reorient its, its external economic strategy. Our strategy is and will continue to be one of deepening the modernization process and inserting ourselves competitively in the international economy. Once the short-term obstacles to modernization are removed, Brazil will resume its development in a sustained manner. This positive view of the country is shared by foreign investors as evidenced by the huge inflows of foreign currency into the country. We know that it's worthwhile to invest in an economy where the real side is natural resource, the qualification of its, business, of its businessmen, and the diversification of its industry exceeds in a large measure those of emerging developing country. In conclusion, we must recall that perhaps our greatest challenge is to promote stabilization in the context of redemocratization re process, which we consider irreversible. When we compare Brazil with other Latin countries, we have adjusted their which have adjusted their economies, we, of we often overlook the political component. Some countries carried out their structural reforms before opening up in the political realm. Others took advantage of a special party, party framework. In our case, the process of economic reforms coincided with the, re, the re democratization. This brought about social demands which had been repressed for a long time under the authoritarian regime and led to the fragmentation of political parties, making it difficult to implement an economical and social reform. From the social point of view, one of the results, results was a great confu confusion between rights and desires, which overexpanded the duties of the state without a non-inflationary financing base to offset them. Our political forces and society are not deluded by the purgative virtues of inflation. They are not deluded, but deluded by populism either, which is the shortest path to economic and social disaster. For this reason, 
They are permanently engaged in rebuilding the state. This task is not restricted to recovering the fiscal basis as an end itself, but rather is as a tool for stabilizing the economy and meeting social rights, finally providing the Brazilian state with a true public character. Thank you very much. Thank you for those uh, thoughtful and well-structured remarks. We can now have uh, questions from the floor. The reason for the two microphones, and it would be helpful, is because uh, this is being videotaped. So it would be helpful for those of you that have questions, if you would step up to the microphone. Let me ask uh, the first one as a start. There's one there and one there. Um, one, from, an, from an American point of view, as you know, these days we're very much caught up in the debate about NAFTA. And uh, NAFTA, as it stands now, of course, only involves the United States, Canada, and Mexico. But there has been much discussion of whether, if it indeed uh, survives in the United States, it should be extended. I wondered if you could uh, tell us something about the questions of trade in Brazil and in the Americas, and, and what, if anything, uh, you look to the future with regard to the United States and extending a North American free trade agreement to be a North and South American free trade agreement. OK, <clears throat> I'll try in English without reading it, but I'll try. We are also starting in South America our own NAFTA, we call Mercosur. It's a trade agreement between Brazil, Argentina, Uruguay, and uh, Paraguay. And uh, we have a lot of problems because one, one of the problems is the a difference between the economies, uh, the stage of the economies, but we are working very hard. We are in Brazil and even in Argentina, Uruguay, and Paraguay in the direction to build this agreement. We think that is our goal and is very important to our economies to build, to build as fast as possible this, uh, this agreement and, and make it work. And uh, in relation to America, I think that uh, it, will to be, it can be uh, uh, another uh, step in the future, but uh, I think that's not uh, a near future. I don't believe that it can be in a, in, a, in a new future for Brazilian reasons and for American reasons also. I can keep asking questions if the rest of you don't have. Uh, let me ask, uh, oh well. All right, would you step to the microphone, please? Yeah. You talked about uh, the various. Could you identify yourself? Yes, my name is Christina Lam. I'm a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University, but I've just come back from living in Brazil for three and a half years as the Financial Times correspondent. And I'd like to ask uh, you talked about the various um, fiscal measures that Finance Minister Fernando Henrique is taking, but I'd like to know whether you think that's enough to reduce inflation, which is now, I believe, 34% a month. And I'd also like to know your views about the possibility of dollarizing the Brazilian economy, as Argentina did. Well, uh, uh, the fiscal reform is the first and uh, necessary step to start a stabilizing policy to reduce the inflation rates. It's not the only condition and the only measure. We have uh, to work in, uh, in the, as I said before, in the reconstruction in the state itself, not in the short term. But we have to, to give signals to the society that uh, we have political will to build a new shape on the state. Also, we have to, 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 to get uh, a, a, a fiscal discipline in short term. And uh, it's possible. And I think that uh, till the end of this year, we can have different figures in our fiscal scenario. Um, 
you uh, the other question is no i don't believe uh, i don't believe that we, we are going to dollarize our economy our economy is very different of argentina economy in many ways we are very different we and we are not uh, intending to do the same policy as argentina did because we have a, a different level of industrialization that Argentina has and uh, different goals of in industrialization, in industrialization also. So uh, uh, it's, uh, I think that in my opinion, it's a big mistake to compare the two situations. Of course, we, we admire what uh, Argentina uh, succeeded uh, after uh, hyperinflation, but their conditions are completely different of our conditions. And we are not intending, I can assure you, to dollarize the economy. Uh, my name is Antonio Carlos do Amaral. I'm from Brazil. I'm a graduate student of the Harvard Law School and also here in the Kennedy School. Uh, I would like to know what is your proposal concerning the problem of representation in the National Congress of Brazil when you have uh, one third of the population elect just uh, elect two thirds of the representatives and two thirds of the population elect just one third? You are from Sao Paulo or are you Grande do Sul? Sao Paulo. <laughs> <laughs> because I always answer this question when I go to debates in Sao Paulo and Rio Grande do Sul, because I'm from the Northeast. Uh, of course, there's a distortion now. Uh, we have uh, an over-representation in the North, in the small states of the North of the country, and the state of Sao Paulo itself, it's less represented. And I think that in the constitutional review now, we're going to change it, not to a proportional, uh, uh, strictly proportional representation, because it's not possible. Because São Paulo will, for example, will will have, if it's just proportional, we'll have about 120 deputies uh, on a universe of 500, and uh, at least. Uh, uh, 10 states will have only one representative. So Sao Paulo alone could uh, decide the, the, all the important matters in the country. But it's important to say that uh, uh, we have a, a very unequal country, not only in, in income per capita per person, but in a regional basis only. So we have to take care and we have to, to pay attention to all the imbalance that we have in the country. That's why we have to, 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 to improve the representation of Sao Paulo, but in the manner that the small states have the, the right to, to, to have uh, some force in the Congress either. Thank you. Uh, Fee Osman, uh, I am a Brazilianist journalist, and I also run the Brazil seminars at Columbia University. You read Veja and I read Veja. Do you remember the interview that Elio Gaspari did with Delphine Neto? And the most and the salient thing to my mind that was said there, he said to link with a question that was asked here, in Argentina, via the dollarization, they, uh, they were able to complete an excellent plan. Do you think we can do that in Brazil? That was Elio asked. And Delphine Neto said no, because every plan is 5% is project and 95% execution. It hasn't worked with, uh, what was the, the, the first plan? It hasn't worked at all in the last 10 years. And again, we will not be able to carry the, the project out that Fernando Enrique could have, but the plan won't work. What is your opinion on that one? Sour grapes? Well, I don't believe in the dollarization if, no. even in any way in Brazil, because the, the conditions is very different. Uh, uh, but uh, what we have different of Argentina is political conditions. We don't have a political majority in the Congress to uh, capable to support all the reforms the, the, uh, the Brazilian economic staff in the government 
wants to do. This is a big and very important difference. But I would say that uh, we have now, uh, despite the opinion of Mr. Delfinetto, one of the best staff in economic, in the government we had, maybe in our history, is one of the best we ever had. And uh, it's, uh, I, I'd like to, to, to remind you that Mr. Delfinetto was the former finance minister during the authoritarian regime. And it's natural that uh, he doesn't agree with me. Uh, I am uh, Alexandre Benning. I am uh, from Brazil. And uh, I'm one of the eight MBA students that joined the Harvard Business School this year. I think it's like a record number. We never had as many here. We have four of us here, actually. And uh, the question that comes to mind, you know, we all intend to go back to Brazil basically after this course. And uh, in the event that you decide to uh, uh, go on the ticket for the presidency on next election, uh, what would be the five biggest points of your program? Sounds like a Kennedy school question. <laughs> well, I would say that the first is to, as, as I said, is to reconstruct the state, but not in the sense of the liberal sense, that reduce the state, lessening, lessening the, the, the presence of the state in the all activities. It's a reconstruct the state. The state that we have now in Brazil is bankrupted. So we have to, to rebuild in the different bases where the is, of course, is not a, an entrepre entrepreneurial state and it's not uh, a cartorial, cartorial uh, state. And um, has to be very strong to work in to aim the to reduce the imbalance between regions and people. Um, that's is it's the main the main reconstruction, the main reform, and it's not easy to do. It's very difficult because. Uh, the most important sectors of Brazilian activity now, most uh, strong, strong, stronger uh, uh, unions are made by the statal corporatism, and not the miserables, not the poor people. The peer, poor people in Brazil about, uh, and I say poor, not miserable, it's, it's less than poor. It's about uh, 35 million people has no right and doesn't know how to organi organize themselves and to, to, to make uh, their rights and, uh, in the political field. But uh, we have a, a very strong corp state corporatism that uh, is in one, in one way or the other way is drinking, is eating all the energies of the state. So we have to put those energies in any way, not only in social, but building partners between all those groups and the state to, to take those people off the, uh, the miseria state, miseria level. Uh, my name is Michael Molinsky. I'm a journalist for Bloomberg Business News. I'm also taking a couple classes at Harvard, and I also just returned from three years in Brazil. And um, uh, Economy Minister Fernando Henrique announced on Friday that he's going to unify the exchange rates in Brazil. Uh, could you explain briefly how he's going to do that and whether or not it will work? Oh, I'm sorry, but I cannot. I'm not the finance minister, but I, I cannot explain how. Uh, I know that step by step, the the government intends to put uh, and uh, to to open more and more the Brazilian economy, and uh, 
to give to the Brazilian economy standards of uh, the international financial community. In this sense, uh, it's a step to, because it's not uh, usual in every country, developed country in the world, to have three different uh, currencies or two, three different uh, exchange rates. And uh, his intention to make one. There's no second intentions. And maybe you are right to a Brazilian newspaper now, or you are working, because all the Brazilian newspaper are waiting for a new shock and uh, are asking for what is behind this this uh, initiative of the minister, and I think there's nothing behind it. You think it will work? You think it will work? Yes, yes, yes. I think so. Yes. Hello, my name is Judith Tendler. I'm a professor of political economy at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, the Department of Urban Studies and Planning. And I had a group of graduate students with me, some of whom are here in Serra last year, looking at various achievements of your government. And um, I was hoping that you would talk a little bit tonight about what you're so famous for, which was these achievements, which also have uh, continued on into the, uh, the period following your administration, and, uh, and of, about which there's been a lot of report, reports, not only in the press in Brazil, but uh, internationally in The Economist, in Newsweek, in Time, etc. And so uh, I wanted to ask you uh, how this experience of governing that uh, you had in Ceará, uh, in which you were able to, to turn things around so dramatically in the state, uh, I wanted to ask you how that changed your views about, about governing. Uh, and I know this is a, perhaps a difficult question to ask uh, on the spur of the moment, but that's the question I wanted to ask you. Well, let's try. I would say that uh, the state of Sierra maybe uh, is one of the poorest states in the country. And, uh, but it's not very different in the in public administration scenario, different of the other states, even states like Sao Paulo or Rio or Minas Gerais that are the rich states in Brazil. If you have, for you to have an idea, when I start my government six years ago, uh, all the income of the state, of the public income with taxes and everything, was 60% of our payroll. All the income only of the payroll, not uh, of our expenses, only of the payroll. And uh, we were uh, five months delayed with the payment, in default with the payroll payment. And at the same time, so, but how, 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 how to manage it? How the other governments in the past used to manage this? Is, is to, have, to, to give an idea how the, the Brazilian state is completely destroyed. They used to, all states has its own uh, bank. And they used to use their own bank to finance this difference. And of course you say, so the bank will go in bankruptcy. No, because the central bank by political, is one of the, the sides of the clientelism, one of the sides of the clientelism. By political ways, the central bank, if uh, we were of the same party of the president, and we are supporting him in the Congress, the central bank will finance this deficit. So we have a big, big deficit in the bank, and we have, and, uh, we have no way to invest or to, 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 to govern. And, uh, we have in the payroll 146,000 people in the payroll of the state. And uh, in the first day, I call everyone to work. And if 30 days they are not working, they will be fired. 
Uh, with a, a lot of, of small uh, initiatives, for example, we have uh, 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 people with five, six, seven, eight, even, even 15 jobs in the state that we found in our administration. <laughs> and we, we forbid it, and you are, all, uh, you are all only to have one job in the state. Uh, second, uh, there's a, a, a very common habit in the Brazilian administration to make politics is to, to put an um, uh, employee of the state in what we call this disposition, in available to another institution. So I have a friend that is governor of the state of any state, ex state. And uh, uh, he asked me to put, uh, I asked him to put uh, employee because he is my protected. Uh, available to this state, so I continue to pay, and and formally he he is working for the other state, and I, I it was forbidden to do this, and we found ten thousand people available to other all other states and institution. We found people living in New York, in Paris, <laughs> available to some institution. Ten thousand people, so. And, uh, and, and uh, it, it seems very easy to do this, but it's not very easy. Christina Lam lived in Brazil, and she knows that it's not very easy. I stay because this make part of the state corporatism that uh, I, uh, I said that I, I talked about in my speech. And they are very strong. They have very strong unions. And uh, with the, 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 the democracy, the, the redemocratization of the country, there's a big confusion between the right and the, the, the strongness of the unions. And I have to, 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 to face many strikes of the old uh, public employees of the state. I stayed in my office once, uh, 10 days completely surrounded by public uh, uh, employees, and I could not go out and, or to talk with somebody because they are very, uh, they are asking for to readmit all those people. So in six months, for example, we fired, fired because it's not a fight, 40,000 people in the state of the Sierra with those initiatives. And, uh, uh, and we re rebuild all the income structure of the, the state income, the, the tax income state. And in one year, we, are, we were balanced, paying the, the payroll, and, uh, uh, but without money to invest or to, to, to make something different. In two years, we had money enough to invest in our state. And uh, the difference, that's why it was so uh, visible for many people and many journalists, because one of the poorest states in the country has more money to invest than the state of Sao Paulo, for example. That is the richest countries has in some, uh, some ways the standards of lives and incomes of the first world. And we had this, uh, more money to invest than the state in Sao Paulo. And uh, we had uh, all our debts, the state debts, with the union, with the banks. Uh, in Gia, I would say, in updated. Uh, 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 just the opposite of the state of Sao Paulo. I say Sao Paulo because Sao Paulo is the richest country in the in the world, in the, the in the in the, in the, in the richest state in the country. And uh, yes, and uh, in the other hand, at the same time, we started with UNICEF some small programs uh, against the, that we call the miseria, the miseria absoluta, the, the levels of miseria. And one of it was to, to uh, 
uh, to reduce the mortality, uh, infant mortality. And uh, it was a very simple and non-expensive program that we, we, we can do, uh, is to, to, to invite uh, someone of the community to take care of 200 families and to, 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 to invite him with a, a small wage and uh, give him a small training and, uh, and teach him how to take care of the uh, just born children. And because we made the research and discovered that the, the main uh, reason for the high mortality in our state was the um, uh, deshydratation, dehydration, dehydration caused by infections because of the water, because we don't have water, uh, clean water in the house. And uh, as we didn't have how to start to uh, sewer and water plan in, in short term basis, we teach him how to uh, give to the families uh, a small medicine that is water, uh, a glass of water, mamadeira, uh, water with a little bit of salt and a little bit of sugar. This is enough to stop the, the dehydration, dehydration. And with this, then in two or two, in three years, we had about 3,000 that we call agent, uh, health agents. Now 7,000. You know, it was at my time. Now it's 7,000. When I uh, finished my government, it was 3,000. Now, now, it's, now it's more than that. Now it's more than that. Thank you. We'll have two more questions. Uh, my name is Vera Troj, and I'm a portfolio manager specializing in emerging stock markets. I was hoping you could speculate on what specific measures you expect to be passed uh, at the Constitutional Convention this October. You already speculated. <laughs> <laughs> About the, the reforms in the Constitution? Reforms yes. in the Constitutional yeah. Review. Yeah? yeah? Well, it's, it's difficult to say, but uh, I, I can say that uh, one is to one that we have to to review is about uh, the the uh, previdência aposentadoria, the aposentadoria, special retired program. We have a, a special. Uh, the, the a retire program for special people, like public teachers, and we have some kind of uh, programs of uh, retirement that we have to review. We have to review also the stabili stability of the public employee. Uh, I don't know if you are aware, but in, in Brazil now, the public employee cannot be fired. So we have to review. And uh, we have to review maybe some things uh, about uh, economic, uh, economic, uh, uh, economic articles, like to the monopoly of the government in telecommunications and uh, maybe other sectors, and uh, to some, some uh, areas related to the foreign capital because it's not very very important thing, but uh, maybe it can be reviewed. I'm also from the investment community. My name is Marina Chaveri. I run Bearings uh, Latin America Equity Group here in Boston. Um, we we know that inflation has hurt the poor dramatically. But to what extent have, has the middle class been hurt sufficiently so that there really exists the will to do something about inflation? In other words, are we going to have to see, or is there a possibility that we might have to see the hyperinflation we saw in Argentina or go back to the 70 or 80 percent per month inflation rates before economic stabilization really occurs? Yes. 
That's a very important question. I think that uh, we didn't stop our inflation yet because we have a, a very, very common uh, phenomenon in our economy that is indexation. Is indexation is, is for everything. So from the middle class to the higher class to the companies and to organized groups, they know how they, they learn during this period of long period of inflation how defend themselves of inflation by the indexation system. And uh, so those groups are not suffering enough to really have a strong will to finish with the inflation. And who is really suffering with the, the inflation is the very poor people and the miserable people that they can they have no association enough to press uh, the society to really stop it with, with inflation. But on the other hand, I don't believe that we, we are going to have hyperinflation in Brazil like in, in Argentina. One of the reasons because the, of the uh, indexation system that we were very familiar to, to, to manage and to live with the, the indexation system. And uh, till the end of the year, or the beginning, of the next year, I don't, um, don't believe that we are going to have uh, hyperinflation. Uh, my name is Paulo Mordehashvili. I'm a student at Harvard College. And uh, I graduated in June. And basically, my question is like the, the MBA students, when, when you go back to Brazil, you've mentioned before that the consti constitutional reform is essential to the, the economic stabilization program and the process in general. Uh, you think, um, how, how do you see that this development from the, the reform itself, the constitutional reform, all the way to the election next year, do you think there is, there is room in this time period, in this time frame, for real improvements in terms of the economy? And um, how, no, um, uh, the the constitu constitutional reform is due to be a very long process. It's not going to be, it might not be over by the, end of, by the end of the year. And also, what's the role of the PMDB in the process? Uh, I'm sorry? PSDB. What's the role of the PSDB uh, as one of the largest parties in Brazil in the process um, in the constitu constitutional reform? Mm -hmm. Yes, you were right. I, I didn't say that the, the constitutional review was essential. It's, it's very important, but not essential to, to resume the economic growth. But you were right about the, the time of the, the discussions of the constitutional reform. That's why we are trying now, now in these days, to, with other leaders of other parties, like the PMDB, PMDB and the PFL, and uh, other parties, to, to build some point, to find some common points, to start the, 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 the review, the reform, the period of reform that formally uh, started in October, with some, point, some agreements within some uh, co points that all the big parties are, uh, are in agreement. Because then the other, the other question that we are discussing is to, in the internal regime, internal uh, rules of the, 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 con the constitutional revision, is to uh, to put in the text the day to, to start and the day to finish. And uh, I'll say that the opinion of the majority is now is to put in the text that the day to finish, it will be uh, the last day of February. Well, let me just uh, say where we uh, Americans are prone to think of Brazil as this uh, sleeping giant to our south, as we sometimes say. And, uh, now we can see with leaders like you, uh, an alarm clock has arrived to our uh, neighbor. And we're very grateful to you for helping us to understand more about your country and appreciate your being with us here tonight. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thanks, Joey, for my English. That was wonderful.